Second Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12 verses. Found your place, we'll all stand for the reading of the word of God. Second Corinthians chapter one, verses one through twelve. And the scripture says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, and Timothy, our brother, under the church of God, which is at Corinth, with all the saints which are in all Achaia. Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort, who comforteth us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort them which are in any trouble by the comfort wherewith we ourselves are comforted of God. For as the sufferings of Christ abound in us, so our consolation also aboundeth by Christ. And whether we be afflicted, it is for your consolation and salvation, which is effectual in the enduring of the same sufferings which we also suffer. Or whether we be comforted, it is for your consolation and salvation. And our hope of you is steadfast, knowing that as ye are partakers of the sufferings, so shall ye be also of the consolation. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength insomuch that we despaired even of life. But we had the sentence of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raiseth the dead, who delivered us from so great a death, and hath, excuse me, and doth deliver, in whom we trust that he will yet deliver us. Ye also helping together by prayer for us, that for the gift bestowed upon us by the means of many persons, thanks may be given by many on our behalf. For our rejoicing is this, the testimony of our conscience that in simplicity and godly sincerity, not with fleshly wisdom, but by the grace of God, we have had our conversation in the world and more abundantly to you work. Now, Father, uh, please, Lord, I pray and ask for your blessings. Lord, I pray and ask, Father, for your guidance and your power and your direction, Lord, in the delivering of this message, and I pray and ask it in Christ's name. Amen. Who comforteth us in all our tribulation. Now verse 8 here, though, is one that's kind of struck me. You know, pretty much all my Christian life, because of the revelation that it gives us of the Apostle Paul. For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble which came to us in Asia, that we were pressed out of measure, above strength, insomuch that we despaired even of life. Yeah, I mean, that's pretty rough. That's pretty rough. You know, during Paul's second day, uh, journey, his second missionary journey, when he crossed the Sea of America uh, from Asia into Europe, uh, I mean, you read the book of Acts, and he experienced a, a, a wonderful reception of the gospel of Jesus Christ, a tremendous number of conversions, uh, you know, there are churches being planted and built all throughout uh, this part of Europe, here, uh, where he and his associates had traveled to, uh, but where great works mm -hmm. for God are being done, you're going to find great opposition and trouble from the devil. Now you've got you know, Paul, Silas, and Titus, and Luke, and Timothy, and others 
uh, working, you know, with them who suffered uh, everything from <laughs> bad attitudes to death. I mean, Paul was killed. He was stoned to death uh, on this missionary journey. You know, so he says, you know, here in, in verse 8, so we despaired even of life. Uh, you know, so, yeah, we're seeing, you know, this tremendous outpouring of the Holy Spirit of God and, and the power of the Holy Spirit of God. But the trials, the tribulations, the, the difficulties that they're experiencing being faithful to God uh, were every bit as great. And it almost seems like a, uh, you know, why would that be? You know, but again, where there's great works for God are being done, then the, the devil is going to be pouring. That's where his effort gets poured in. Go to chapter 11, if you will, in 2 Corinthians. I'm going to read some more verses about Paul. Pick it up at verse 21. Chapter 11, 2 Corinthians 11, pick it up at 21 down to verse 30. Paul says, I speak as concerning reproach, as though we had been weak, howbeit whereinsoever any is bold, I speak foolishly, I am bold also. Are they Hebrews? So am I. Are they Israelites? So am I. Are they the seed of Abraham? So am I. Are they the ministers of Christ? I speak as a fool, I am more. In labors, more abundant. In stripes, above measure. In prisons, more frequent. In death, oft. Of the Jews, five times received I forty stripes, save one. Thrice was I beaten with rods. Once was I stoned. Thrice I suffered shipwreck. A night and a day have I been in the deep. In journeyings, often in perils of water, in perils of robbers, in perils of mine own countrymen, in perils by the heathen, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and painfulness, in watchings often, in hunger and in thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness. Besides those things that are without, that which cometh upon me daily, the care of all the churches. Who is weak, and I am not weak? Who is offended, and I burn not? If I must needs glory, I will glory of the things which concern mine infirmities. I mean, he's nearly blind. His body <laughs> is broken. You know, he's suffering. Physically, I mean, to the point that he has to have a personal physician, Luke, travel with him everywhere he goes. He needs a constant attention of a physician in his life. It's how rough it is for him. Stay there in Second Corinthians. Go down to the next chapter, though. Pick it up at verses 5 through 10. Of such a one will I glory, yet of myself will I not glory, but in mine infirmities. For though I would desire to glory, I shall not be a fool. For I will say the truth, but now I forbear, lest any man should think of me above that which he seeth me to be, or that he heareth of me. And lest I should be exalted above measure, through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for, for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, 
in distresses for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. In Acts 20, verse 34, Paul says, Ye yourselves know that these hands have ministered unto me, or excuse me, ministered unto my necessities and to them that were with me. Yeah. He, he labored with his own hands. I mean, and again, here's a guy who's nearly blind. Uh, his, his body's been all busted up. Uh, but if you go back to 1 Corinthians 4, it tells you what he does. 1 Corinthians 4, verses 10 through 13. You know, we are fools for Christ's sake, but ye are wise in Christ. We are weak, but ye are strong. Ye are honorable, but we are despised. Even unto this present hour we both hunger and thirst, and are naked, and are buffeted, and have no certain dwelling place. And labor, working with our own hands, being reviled, we bless, being persecuted, we suffer it, being defamed, we entreat, we are made as the filth of the world, and are the offscouring of all things unto this day. Now he's laboring with his own hands. He's working with Priscilla and Aquila. Uh, we're tent makers. So tents are made by, you know, first, you know, you have to produce the cloth, the material for that, but then you put in the day, you're sewing. Okay, and here's a guy that can barely see anything beyond right there in front of his face. Sewing. Tents. Uh, the, that, 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 we won't go there, but that should be in Acts 18 where it talks about him meeting with Priscilla and Aquila. And he abolished them because they were of the same craft. They were tent makers. Now in 1 Corinthians 11, though, the first verse there, Paul tells us, Be ye followers of me, even as I am of Christ. He says, I'm your example. I'm your example. Uh, it says it again in, in, in chapter 4, verse 16, in 1 Corinthians. Wherefore, I beseech ye, be followers of me. He is our example. But not just in the doctrine that he received by revelation from the Lord Jesus Christ on uh, how we are to you know, conduct ourselves and, and the things that we are to believe uh, as the New Testament church. Now, Paul, okay, you know he's a Jew, okay, he's a member of the body of the Lord Jesus Christ, on um, which there is no Jew or Gentile, you know, so he is an example to all Christians, okay, not just Jewish believers, okay, but all Christians, because he is the apostle to the Gentiles. Uh, and Paul's example of how to deal with the trials and the tribulations that we experience in our life is just as an important doctrine to follow as anything else. I mean, no, I'm Paul's a fighter. All right. Uh, in his younger years, he was a very athletic man. Uh, and he can't strive physically so much, but spiritually, he definitely fights. He definitely strives uh, against the hindrances of life. Uh, 1 Corinthians, again, chapter 9. Look at these things about Paul, our example. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 24 to the end of the chapter. Know ye not that they which run in a race run all, but one receiveth the prize, so run that you may obtain. Okay, you don't, okay, the race that you're in. And each one of you has got your own race. To, okay, you don't run for second place. <laughs> okay? You know? You're not running and, and hope that you just show. 
Okay, you run to win. Okay. Verse 25, and every man that striveth for the mastery is temperate in all things. Now, they do it to obtain a corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. I therefore so run, not as uncertainly, no, I know what I'm running for and I know how to run, okay? So fight I, not as one that beateth the air. I'm not shadow boxing here. I'm, I'm landing my punches and following through. Okay? But I keep my body, okay? I keep under my body. Okay, it doesn't matter what my body wants. I keep under my body and I bring it into subjection. I don't let it bring me into subjection, lest that by any means, when I have preached to others, I myself should be cast away. In other words, God puts him aside because he's not fulfilling what God sent him to do. Go to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians 3, we're looking at uh, verses 10 through 14. Again, the Apostle Paul, that I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his suffering being made conformable unto his death. If by any means I might attain unto the resurrection of the dead, not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after, and I says, look, I know I haven't made it there yet, and I can't make it there in this life, but I still strive for that because that is my end. Not as though I had already attained, either were already perfect, but I follow after that I may apprehend that for which also I am apprehended of Christ. And he's talking about the regeneration. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. I know I'm not perfect. I'm not perfect yet, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before, I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Okay, I'm pressing, I'm pushing, I'm striving. I've got a mark, I've got a target that I want to go for. And that's what I am attempting to gain. 2 Corinthians 12, 10. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities, in reproaches, in necessities, in persecutions, in distresses, for Christ's sake, for when I am weak, then am I strong. I mentioned there in uh, prayer time there about Brother Coates in Canada. And uh, after last Sunday, uh, where they refused to let the authorities in to try to harass the pastor, uh, they came back in the middle of the night and had fenced off their property and locked them out of their building. You know, which isn't distressing them at all. That's kind of funny because, see, they don't understand the church is in the building. The church is the people. And right now, I have no doubt that that place is surrounded by hundreds of people. <laughs> you, know? Uh, you know, they're not going to win in the end. And that doesn't mean necessarily that they're not going to be affected by the government. But in the end of things, when the Lord is glorified, And this is the key right here to dealing with all the tribulations that we might have to face in this life. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It, weakness <laughs> causes us to lean on God. Revelation 3.17 says, Because thou sayest I am rich, and increased with goods, 
and have need of nothing. And this is the, the attitude of the Laodicean church. And we don't need you. You know? And Christ tells them again, and knoweth not that thou art wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. The Laodicean church thinks that it, you know, and it, 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 it's got it all, and it's got nothing. It's got nothing because their strength is not in the Lord. It's in their own wherewithal. You know, you know those who trust and lean on the flesh and the world, you know, and they have their confidences are in the flesh and in the world, are those who are most subject to disappointment and failure in their lives. Psalm 147, verse 10 and 11, the Lord says, you know, he delighted not in the strength of a horse. Because somebody might have a better horse than you. <laughs> he taketh not pleasure in the legs of a man. Okay, You might have strong legs, but there's always the guy that's stronger than you. Okay, what does the Lord take pleasure in? The Lord taketh pleasure in them that fear him. In those that hope in his mercy. You know, God could care less that Saul was almost seven feet tall. He failed them over and over again. And you know why God told Saul why he failed? You know, you know, when you didn't think that you were a big deal, you were trusting in me. But then when you thought you could do it on your own, that's when you stumbled and fell. Accepting the fact that we have no control and no power in this life is essential. It's essential to our having the correct mindset in this life and our relationship with God. I can't control anything. I can't you know, I don't have to really have the power over, I mean, people try, you know, the story of Jacob, you know, uh, through, you know, the early years of his life, primarily, you know, he was a conniver, <laughs> he was a schemer, he was always trying to, you know, didn't get him anything, you know, that worked against him almost every time. They, you can't treat the Lord as your last resort. The Lord can't be treated as, okay, well, that's my fallback position, <clears throat> is trusting in God. You know, okay, I've tried everything and failed, Lord. Now I need you to work. Yeah. And it's like, well, no kidding, you failed. You know? and, but now you expect me to jump through the hoops. Boy, that's why I refer to a lot of times people that treat God like a gumball dispenser, you know? You know, and you show up when I want you to and give me what I want. You know, uh, the Lord needs to be first in everything. Every aspect of your life, the Lord must be first. He must be the priority of everything. Like, why is it Christians? Those who know that they can do nothing to save themselves. They have no power whatsoever to save their own soul. They put their trust in faith in a supernatural salvation that was accomplished by the Lord Jesus Christ, his finished works offered to man by God's grace. Why is it that they think that they can then of their own selves, their own wisdom, their own strength, their own efforts, meet every challenge, every issue, every problem, every strife, uh, every need, every trouble, every trivial that comes along in their life with their own abilities and their own wisdom and their own strength? And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Okay. Uh, you go through Proverbs, all through Proverbs, how it talks about, you know, get knowledge, get wisdom, 
get understanding. Okay, I don't care how many letters you got stacked <laughs> behind your name. Okay, if your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding isn't coming from the Lord, okay, then you're the village idiot. You know, or, you know, they believe that the world and the mechanisms of the world are things that can protect them and provide them and meet for their their needs. How's the world doing? <laughs> how 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 is? I mean, let's just take our own country. Okay, you know, how, how do you want to rate them for taking care of things, meeting people's needs, providing for people, doing what's right, doing what's decent, doing what's good? Not a very good report card there. Second Corinthians three five says, "Not that we are sufficient of ourselves to think anything of ourselves." You've got to reach that point. You have to accept that fact that I can't do it. Without you, I can't do it. You know, and 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 this is. You know, again, there's, there's a story about a uh, Chinese pastor, and this is this is back, you know, before uh, communism in China in the 1930s, when China was the fastest growing as far as conversions uh, Christian country in the world. Uh, he had come to the United States and visited the, and when he got back to China, he was asked. You know about the state of things here in this country in Christianity. He said it's amazing what Christians can do without God. You know, meaning the fact that everything that they were doing was all by human effort and money, where they were trusting solely in the power of God. Now. You know, okay. Let's say you 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 do great things based on your effort. You know, churches like that. You know, human effort, human mentality. Uh, my thing. Who's getting the glory? Who's getting the glory? Are those works going to stand at the judgment seat of Christ? Well, wrong motive. Wrong motive. Let God provide those things. Mortal beings that exist in a corrupt and imperfect world, which is our case, have such a limited strength, intelligence, and ability. You know, but our God, our Savior, who created all that is, is absolutely unlimited in his power, his wisdom, his strength, and his abilities. And he likes to use them on your behalf. He loves to be able to do that, but most of the time where he doesn't, it's not because he doesn't want to, but because he's being hindered by the Christians from doing it. You know, he said, I am the Lord, is there anything too hard for me? I mean, come on, what do you need? Give me a try. Uh, you know? And, you know, so it begs the question, why are we not going to him first for everything that we need? Yeah. I mean, look at the Apostle Paul again. He took a back seat to the Lord in everything. Absolutely, he made no choices for himself in life. Lord, what would you have me to do? I mean, there on the Damascus Road, this is first response. Lord, what would you have me to do? And that was that was his entire life. Lord, what would you have me to do? My wants don't carry into it. In fact, 
recorded in the Bible one time that he put his wants and his desires ahead of what God wanted, it got him jailed and sent to Rome. Now God was going to let him go to Rome anyways. It's just it probably would have been a more comfortable trip <laughs> than the one he had to go through to get this. He made no plans for himself. Where do you want me? You know, the second missionary jury, they're going and the Holy Spirit said, no, you can't go there. They're trying to go north instead of keep going west. Twice did that. One said, no, can't go there. Won't let you in there. You know, so that they went across there, that sea, and over to uh, Macedonia, went from Asia into Europe and began to spread the gospel to the Gentile peoples. Yeah. He had no personal goals for anything. You know, you know, whatever God wants to accomplish through me is what God wants to accomplish through me. It doesn't matter what I want. It doesn't matter. You know, if I think that, okay, this is enough or this is too little, or, you know, here am I. You know, uh, I say, here am I, send me. Here am I, send me. What do you want? Everything in his life was what the Lord wanted from his wife. No matter what come along in Paul's life, he knew it was directed by the Lord. Doesn't matter what it was. He knew it was directed by the Lord. And he didn't try to control it. He didn't try to influence it. He didn't try to direct it in any way. He just accepted what came along, whether it was good or bad, whether it was 